And joining us now is Meg Motley, an Aquatic Invasive Species Management Coordinator for the Lake Champlain Basin Program. Welcome, it's good to see you again. Nice to be here, thank you. You were with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers during their recent tour of Lake Champlain as they looked over a few potential projects. The breakwater is one of them, fixing up or replacing that breakwater near the ferry docks at Gordon's Landing. As we heard in the piece, that is really a vital crossing for people going from New York to Vermont, back and forth, a million vehicles crossing every year. Mm -hmm. And we saw the engineers inspecting the breakwater along with stakeholders from the ferry company, Vermont Fish and Wildlife, and Ellen Marsden, a fisheries biologist who studies lake trout. In recent years, the area around that breakwater has really become a critical spawning ground for, for lake trout. Yeah, um, in fact, since the early 2000s, um, Ellen Marsden and her team have been working on lake trout and the issue in Lake Champlain is that lake trout have been reproducing, um, meaning that they can spawn and provide, they can produce young. Um, the issue is whether or not they're recruiting, meaning do those young go out into the lake, survive to an age of reproduction and come back and able to reproduce again. So what we're seeing is when we're capturing or collecting lake trout, we can tell the difference between the stocked lake trout that have maybe a fin clip or a tag that we can recognize versus those that don't have those markers. And we're seeing a significant increase in those that don't have those markers, which is really great news. That's great protection for them, for the eggs and for the fry. Yes. So that's a concern that if there's a massive project there, placement of the breakwater altogether or a lot of work going on around mm -hmm. there, there's probably concern about what impact that could have on, on Lake Trout. Yeah, and this is where um, the Army Corps has really taken the lead in bringing in the biologists to work with this project so that it's not just a safety breakwater for navigation, but also that they're taking the habitat considerations into concern, thinking specifically about Lake Trout. So it was very helpful. They've just started to map uh, the deterioration of this breakwater. Um, they're going to do more surveying, but they're learning from biologists like Ellen Marsden um, about what habitat is critical, what the spawning times of year would be, um, so that they can take that into consideration when they go to either um, reconstruct or rebuild the breakwater. And at this point, they haven't made up their minds yet. Are they leaning one way or the other as far as either replacing the whole thing or, or just doing a fix? Yeah, that's a great question. I think there is isn't quite enough data gathered yet. They've done the initial survey, they're coming back to do more surveys, which involve underwater you know, divers and some um, more of the hydrology and um, engineering work. I think then they'll be able to determine if the large pieces of stone that are there are enough to support a rebuild or if they need to get in there and really re position them to rebuild the breakwater. And is the funding assured or is it one of those projects where they make a proposal, then they have to go to Congress and look to get the money to pay for it. Yep, it's the latter, you're right. So this is the study, and the study will come out with a recommendation of how to proceed, and then it will be up to our congressional leadership to go and secure that funding to restore that breakwater. So this is probably still a few years off. I, absolutely, I think the end of the study will conclude hopefully at the end of next calendar year, um, and then they'll have a recommendation to move forward with uh, a proposal for how to rebuild or reconstruct what is there. When the Army Corps of Engineers were here for a couple of days, they toured a few other sites. Uh, there are a couple Absolutely. of other potential projects, including on the Champlain Canal. Yeah. There's been talk for 20 plus years about potentially putting in some type of a barrier to stop invasive species from making their way up the Champlain Canal to Lake Champlain because that's how a lot of invasives end up in, in the lake. That's exactly that's right. That's the route. Yeah. Um, we have a number of vectors in which invasive species can move across the landscape, and we have been able to document the greatest number of those non-native invasives entering Lake Champlain from the Champlain Canal. What we're looking at is trying to separate these watersheds um, with, a, with some kind of barrier. There's a number of different measures we can look at, whether it's building some kind of a boat lift, or if we're talking about doing some kind of a treatment within an existing lock chamber or creating a new chamber. Um, there are screens that we could put in to prevent the spread of certain taxa or fish, larger larger mm -hmm. organisms. Um, so this, this report is really taking a look at all of those different measures and putting them into different alternatives. And we're gonna have an evaluation of those alternatives with stakeholder input at the end of this, um, at the end of this project. The exciting part is it's the first time we've really had engineers and the New York State Canal Corporation 
um, working together, looking at the hydrology of the Champlain Canal System. If we were able to put a hydrologic barrier at the height of the canal system, we would effectively be preventing the fish from swimming through, um, the plants from moving or being entrained by boats through. Um, there are certain pathogens that can move with fish and in the water that we would be trying to prevent from moving. And of course, then the smallest things that we can't see with the naked eye. So those um, fish hook and the spiny water flea and those types of species would be prevented from moving. If we're going to be effective at preventing the spread of quagga mussel, for example, from mm -hmm. entering the, the Champlain region, um, we would need some kind of hydrologic barrier. And we've been talking about quagga mussels for a number of years. They, they've been knocking at the door. Uh, the, the thought is they're sort of waiting out there and... Yeah, they're knocking, they're moving, they're marching slowly towards the basin. Um, and they have a number of different ways they can come in. Uh, they are in the St. Lawrence Seaway. Um, and they are close to coming into the Richelieu River, but they would have to move upriver to come towards mm. the Champlain. Uh, basin, which is a natural deterrent, and that's wonderful. Um, however, they are in the Erie Canal, and they're moving east towards the Hudson, and then they could have a quick shot up the Champlain to come into the into Lake Champlain. Would they be even worse than the zebra mussels? They're a little bit larger than a zebra mussel. They're slightly larger. Um, we le I like to call them sort of the evil twin of the zebra mussel. Um, the competitive advantages they have over the zebra mussel are that they can reproduce more frequently and they can survive in deeper waters. Mm. So we might see some of our historic shipwrecks that we have um, had the benefit of being in deeper waters where the zebra mussels don't go. Um, they could be at risk, which would be of great concern um, for preservation of those historic artifacts. And a couple of moments ago, you talked about two other invasive species, the spiny water flea and now the fishhook water flea, yes. which just within the past year or so has been detected in Lake Champlain. Yeah, so the fishhook water flea, unfortunately, was detected in 2018. Similar to spiny water flea, we detected them one year and the next year we had a very large explosion mm. in the population. When they came, they exploded in population, and we were collecting um, thousands of them on downriggers, and they were fouling anglers' fishing lines. And that was just like the spiny water flea, they just muck up the fishing same line. Way, same way, same way. You, for about 10 years now, have worked with other scientists on Lake George, and mm -hmm. they've had the, uh, the misfortune of having an invasive species. And the Asian clam has spread to several spots now throughout uh, Lake George. Yeah, um, in 2010 was the first detection and it was a really great story of early detection and rapid response. Um, all the Lake George partners really rallied together. We evaluated different techniques. We, we really did a lot of um, collaboration with Lake Tahoe who had a similar infestation right. from Asian clam. Um, and we developed a technique um, for smothering them with benthic barrier mats. That was very effective. It was 97 to 99% effective. Um, the challenge with our Asian clam management in Lake George is that we haven't been able to effectively detect the young juvenile stages of Asian clam. And so uh, annually, Lake George and the partners, we have a, a rapid response group, um, go out and sponsor a survey. This year, we um, that, that effort found three new spots um, in Lake George, which brings the total to 27 locations in Lake George. It's a little unfortunate that we haven't been able to really stop their spread within Lake George. Um, we're watching them closely and we haven't detected them in Lake Champlain yet, although Lake George does drain mm -hmm. north and through the Lachute River into Lake Champlain by Fort Ticonderoga. Is the fear though that it may only be a matter of time before they reach Lake Champlain? Um, we expect that they are they they would eventually end up in Lake Champlain